Hello and welcome to States of Change Learning Festival, day 13. Um, great to have you all with us. Um, we are today in, in an exploration mode, I'd say, uh, more than anything. Um, the topic, and I'm just trying to share my screen to get this going. There we go. Um, so the topic of today, culture change. Um, working title, public admin imagination versus bureaucratic creativity. Uh, this session was one of those um, where um, it was more an unfinished thought or a thought bubble, if you will, uh, that sort of drove it to happen. Um, and this was on my part, so I'll, I'll apologize in advance. Um, but this came from a bit of a frustration. So a lot of people, I think, are talking about culture change uh, in many respects and on many levels, in many ways. And, and I thought maybe the time was to check in on what we mean with culture change. What does it actually look like? What should it look like? What are we learning from practice? And where should we be going uh, when we're thinking about this, this term and what can it help us do? Um, so I thought I'd, I'd invite a really great uh, group of people to explore that, maybe the best group of people to explore this with. So welcome Charles Landry, Panthea Lee, and Gabriela Gomez-Mont. Each of you have experiences when it comes to culture change and when it comes to what it means to, to drive it forward. Um, and then we were looking forward to hearing from all of you um, in terms of your experiences and your input uh, before we get a chance to have a broader discussion with, with the group on that. Um, before we do that, I'll, I'll try to kick us off with a, with a few prompts, uh, again, checking into the, the point of the session. And thanks, Charles, for uh, handing me this, uh, this concept of transformation as a culture, cultural project. This came from a conversation I had with Charles two days ago. Uh, so I stole that, Charles, apologies. Uh, but I do think that is, in a way, uh, the, the most accurate way of describing this conversation. Uh, because that's the broad question really, transformation um, in terms of either being driven by organizations or within organizations or being driven from various cultural contexts uh, or, very cultural, or various cultural outputs uh, of society. Um, and then I thought, well, uh, what does that make me think of trans transformation as a cultural project? One was um, coexistence. Um, having a cultural awareness about the diversity that we are part of and actually being able to design for that. Um, another thought was um, the culture of development, the culture of, of how we actually develop service designs, policies for the people that, that we're trying to, to work for or, or serve. Um, and they can look very differently. And there are different cultures at stake when, the, when that, that, that comes. Another thought bubble was uh, Henri Matisse uh, and, a, and, a, and, a, and a text I read uh, a while ago by Hans Joas and Richard Sennett who was talking about Matisse's work and how Matisse uh, is solving the problem of light again and again. Uh, and the point here is that art, when it comes to kind of a, a cultural practice, gives us a different logic. It's not one truth. It's multiple truths, it's multiple expressions, multiple illustrations of what's possible, different ways of seeing. Uh, and, and in a way, it's a very handy logic when it comes to dealing with, with complex issues. Um, so so that, that was a lot of line of thought. Uh, and in the length of that, um, when we think about cultural expression um, and cultural outputs, uh, how, do we, how do we see their value? How do they help us reimagine what's possible? Uh, and I think it's fair to say that in some, uh, in a lot of cases, uh, when we think about the more traditional cultural outputs like arts, uh, novels, and etc., they hold more power uh, when it comes to providing images or narratives that can help drive our, our society forward. So I'm, I'm curious about that and, and where that's lying at, at, at this particular point in time in, in, in COVID crisis uh, and uh, dare I say, um, also using this picture, dare I say, this, this, this sort of resurfacing of racism um, or being 
discussion of racism. And I think that's the final point I, I, I want to make here is um, this is also a question of space. So where is the cultural expressions happening uh, and where are those spaces being incorporated into decision making processes? Um, so to sum up uh, and to get us going, these are some of the initial pr uh, prompts that I'm seeing. I think we will we'll be talking about some version of cultural awareness and what we can use that for um, when it comes to making good decisions. Uh, we will be talking about cultural logics, um, particularly when it comes to organizational culture, bureaucratic culture, but maybe also other, uh, other types. Um, cultural representations. Um, I'm, sh I'm pretty sure we'll hear from, from both Gabriella and, and Panthea and, and Charles on that and, and what, what roles that could play particularly when it comes to illustrating um, what's important, but really hard to describe. And then cultural spaces. So what, what sorts of cultural spaces and activities can work as change mechanisms when it comes to reimagining society and, and driving public innovation. So I'll stop there and um, I will be handing it over to, to the speakers. Uh, but uh, before I do that, just wanna highlight the, the fact that this, this is a bit of an exploration um, it can go in many directions that we'll see. Uh, so please participate in the experiment, share um, thoughts along the way, uh, questions, uh, directions you think the conversation should take, and we'll try to respond. But for now, over to you, Charles, to get us going. Well, well, well. Um, Firstly, I hope I won't disappoint you because yesterday I did a big session, a session on the creative bureaucracy. So I don't want to talk about that today, but we can talk about it later, which is all about innovations or not in that field. And um, I decided to pick up some of the words that Jesper had and uh, felt that these are, I'll, I'll talk about myself. I know that sounds a bit self-focused, but that's really shaped what I think of cultural space is all of these things. So firstly, I am effectively have an emigre experience. My parents were German. I lived in Italy, in Germany, in Britain, and so on. So I'm always asking myself the question, where the hell do I belong when everything is on the move? And I've got this con combination of two words, which are German, Fernweh and Heimweh, which means basically wanderlust and homesickness. So those wanderlust and homesickness are two things that completely are etched into my brain. And this thing about always being on the move has uh, got a, a, an issue obviously behind it. And it relates to cities, people moving in, people coming back, where do they come from? And all of that ultimately is about uh, various identities that are all in a place and a space that somehow we have to bring together. And I'm being all very personal, as you can see, my favorite word is yearning. And the German version of that is addiction, a sort of painful addiction. And from within that comes for me this thing about desire for completion and completeness. And within that again, that thing about home and heimat, they're sort of the same words. But you can see what I'm getting at, because when I'm talking then about places or societies, obviously I feel I'm hoping that perhaps all of us have some variation of that. Um, but what I also see is, of course, like all of you, the fracture, the fragility, the fault lines. And so I think what we're all on about, or I'm trying to be on about, probably unsuccessfully, I don't know, is trying to heal those fractures. And for me, I ex exemplified it in a book I wrote called The Civic City in a Nomadic World. And of course, what's now nomadic will be different than before. But nevertheless, that fracture, that line that you can see on the cover, is the thing that I feel is the task of activism and so on, and the cultural project, to deal with that, to deal with those differences in backgrounds. I know this is a video shot, but nevertheless it exemplifies some of the main religions in the world that need to be in some sort of uh, place together. Now, we all know about the massive changes around that are just happening this very moment, and that unbelievable, let's call it a breakthrough, but what's just happened is potentially a breakthrough in, a, uh, in awareness and therefore urgencies. And what I've found in the current period, a sense of 
clarity but confusion being in the midst of the eye of a storm. I felt these two things uh, simultaneously. And what I love this phrase I heard on a radio program, the hubris, the hybris has been humbled. But what it reminds me of a sentence that one could create, which is basically our civilization is a thin film of order we build around the chaos of events. And I think that's what has happened in the exposure uh, just now. And to some extent, it's a psychological issue. And for all I know, I need to go to the psychiatrist chair. I'm not quite sure. But nevertheless, I'm trying to cope with that. But one of the things I like is this mosaic. You can see the corona, the coronavirus, is how we stitch together again this thing that we need to connect uh, in our differences, or I think we do, or we have some desire when we feel safe-ish to do that. But what has happened to me is I just saw these graffitis some years back and it said capitalism is chaos and anarchy is order. This is only a metaphor for me to talk about these things that are going on in my mind at the moment. Or the other thing, an exhibition I saw recently in Berlin, which had this thing, angst, you know, means anxiety and fear and utopia. And in a sense, this fear of being willing even to imagine and even daring to imagine and then obviously picking up the consequences to actually do something then. And overlaid on that, of course, the immersive effect of the digitizing world that pushes us here and there simultaneously. So you can see what I'm talking about, this thing about where the hell am I when all of these things on the move? And this has put me in two minds, as you can see, with these two things floating in the sky about where am I and what should I think? But when I'm thinking of cultural places and spaces, which was my focus just now, I'm thinking about their places that help me make sense and therefore create understanding, but they also are about meaning making and help me create significance about what is important. Now, this is specifically in the narrower sense, culture. And for me, they simplify the complex, obviously via storytelling in some sort of way. And the problem, as we well know, is the conversations we've had, there's just a picture from a guy who did it down the road from where I live, conversations too far have been about me, 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 me. And the urban conversation I want is that one across boundaries and things like that. But I also want something that goes through all the senses that I experience and have, uh, all the, the emotional landscape I have, and to really draw me in and trigger me. And this is the sense of completion uh, I was highlighting at the very beginning. And when I think of great places and spaces, and great place could be a city, a town, a village or something, there is this question of anchorage and identity opportunity and potential, which seems to be a bit different and opposite, connection and communication, this nurturing and nourishment. I really want to personally be nurtured by the places that I'm inhabiting and I'm in. And I want the bureaucracies and all of that to help that process. Plus, of course, ideally also to provide inspiration and imagination. And there are a couple of places that do that and they're quite odd. This is Helsinki's, uh, it's it, part of the world design capital. It's something in, built by the Department of Employment, believe it or not, and the Anglican Church. And it's just an internal space, which is so Zen-like, talk about bloody mindfulness, that is absolutely wonderful. So this is one of the places and spaces that exemplifies that inside. Just imagine it, it's like a Zen-like place inside. But I'm also so struck, this is the Venice Biennale, you know there are always these signs which say the anonymous stateless immigrants pavilion, it doesn't exist. So you can see, I'm not really helping you, I keep on talking about contrasts at the same time. And the sort of spaces I like, this is the Tate Modern Gallery, taking from a certain angle of course, and also this place in Helsinki, which I think is also a cultural place in space. It's actually an educational institution, but it doesn't look like it. Or it could be even standing below that Anish Kapoor uh, uh, sculpture in Chicago. But I am reminded, and again, this is the anchorage point, this is Athens and is obviously, you know, the archeological thing within the substructure below. And I quite like the fact that it's a metro station 
as well as here the Stolpersteine, these stumbling stones in Berlin, which are just stones in brass of saying this person lived there and was killed by the Nazis. And all of these things are to me emblematic and they're all about trying to bring us together as is this District 6 Museum in Cape Town which is redrawing the map on the bottom of a church which is where people put their name, where they lived, although they were told to leave that whole area. And that reminds me then of a conflict, now I'm getting activist. This is the palace rebuilt, having erased the thing before that was the DDR thing, and it looks roughly like that. And the battle was this one here, where the Green Party said, can't we do this instead? That old stuff is a bit, in let's be modern, let's be today. And this was voted down, it was 6-6, six, six, and the president of the Pr Prussian, whatever it's called, cultural ministry, went for the old version. And so clearly for me, this green thing would have expressed the thing that this should actually be. So what that really tells me is there's a culture 1.0, which is the canon, the repertoire, the patronage, world view of culture, the 2.0, which might be all the cultural industries and all of that, and we know the battles between those forms of culture. And then the 3.0, which is perhaps the activism point that I am, we are makers, shapers and creators of our evolving culture and the transformation that, that, that we, I think, are discussing about. So for me, that leaves a question. What if, and I did a project about this, what if there were no cultural institutions and we reinvented them today? What would they be? And perhaps you can give me the answer to that. And secondly, I suppose there is a logic, the power of the third place logic, which is on the one hand, this outside, this inside, this home, this wanderlust and things I've just mentioned earlier. But one thing that does strike me is the cultural way of thinking about all of this is not our default mechanism. And that's why graffiti is really great because it sometimes tells us the truth. So that's it, thank you. Thanks so much, Charles. And what a great way of kind of diving into this topic. I uh, appreciate both the personal as well as the, the, the more, the, the more meta reflections there. Um, I'm gonna quickly just hand it over before I get into questioning uh, to Panthea. Um, uh, so activism was mentioned a few times by Charles and maybe and I'm just guessing whether that that might play a role in what you have to share but but uh, over to you and, and look forward to hearing from your work. Yeah that was uh, that was really fan fa fantastic so thank you Charles a um, lot of things spinning in my head um, so let me share my screen um, Can you all see my screen? Yeah. yeah. Yes. Okay. Perfect. Uh, so, let me... so yeah, to the point of do we need cultural institutions? Um, that's a really interesting point to end on. Um, so, I'm based in I'm based in uh, in uh, Brooklyn, New York, and there's a there's a lot going on here right now. Uh, there's really beautiful protests um, against police brutality, systemic racism every day, and police sirens just around my house uh, day and night. And as I was trying to gather my thoughts for the session, um, my, my mind kept wandering back to this performance that I saw uh, about exactly this time last year at the New York Philharmonic um, up at Lincoln Center, one of our storied uh, cultural institutions. And it was part of a series that they had called Music of Conscience. Um, they had commissioned the incredible composer David Lang um, to put together uh, this uh, this um, opera, um, uh, basically about um, about uh, sort of uh, wrongful um, accusation, injustice in the criminal justice system, and this was presented in collaboration with a um, couple of different sort of major institutions around the world: uh, the Malmo Opera, London's Barbican, um, others in Rotterdam, Barcelona, and whatnot, and. The whole time I sat there, I was really, really uncomfortable. What doesn't look right about this photo? 
what struck me, um, and as, as I sat there for the entire, I don't know, 90 minute performance, um, all the prisoners are white. Not all, there's maybe, you know, four people of color that I can see. Um, and this was, this was, this was kind of nuts to me. Um, and the, the, the sole um, black man that was a lead character was actually the prison warden that you see here on the right. Um, 11 miles away, you have uh, New York City's main jail complex, uh, Rikers Island. Um, for those that are not from the US, which I think is many of you, um, uh, the US has 5% of the world's population, but 21% of its prisoners. Um, African Americans make about 13% of the populations um, but are about a third of the prison population. So they are incarcerated at more than five times the rate of white people. And as I sat there in this performance, I, I just, I, I, I couldn't help but think to this disconnect. Um, and because the population at Rikers looks very different from those that we see at the spring fundraiser that sort of very same year um, for the Philharmonic. And, um, and these are the ones that are sort of presenting and commissioning these works, this music of conscious uh, of, of uh, conscience. I think we're seeing more and more cultural institutions wanting to do social justice work, wanting to transform our imaginations. Um, but I question sort of, uh, you know, not the gatekeepers themselves, but the, but the sort of modes and sort of norms and the rules and the metrics that we're using for selecting and commissioning and presenting these works. Um, this is the photo of Khalif Browder, um, who I also couldn't help think about as I sat in the audience, because uh, this is a man, a teenager, who at, 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 at the age of 17 was put in, in, a, in a Rikers for allegedly stealing a backpack. Um, he was from the Bronx, and he was put in Rikers for three years, two of which he was in solitary confinement. The charges were finally dropped. Um, uh, and two years later, uh, and then he was released from Rikers. Two years later, he committed suicide. He had suffered a lot of mental, physical, and sexual abuse um, at Rikers. And the city of New York settled with his family for $3.3 million. $3.3 million. And so when I sat there in the audience and I looked at the program, um, it just, it made me deeply uncomfortable. And the chasm is astounding. Um, the chasm in our cultural institutions can be astounding. And, you know, that many of us experience in, in our in our day to day lives. Um, my, my, my work at the intersection of social justice and culture change, whether it's in sort of, um, you know, cultural change societally within organization takes me to some really interesting places. And I think, you know, this is one, um, this is one experience that I have been thinking a lot about lately. Um, this is the Royal Automobile Club in London. It is a private members club um, that I think has been around for about 100 years. It allowed women in in 1998, I believe. Um, and I was there about maybe two or three years ago. Um, I was in London for some work and, um, you know, with some in for there for some for, for some for some partnership discussions. Um, so I've actually never talked about this. And I was sort of brought to this club um, with some colleagues to talk about our work um, with a possible funder, um, someone that was sort of really interested in some projects that we were working on. And I had such a strange experience because as we walked into the door, I was there with um, four other colleagues, um, some from our partner, some from my own team. As we walked in, we were greeted by a board member that descended down the staircase um, and he sat on the boards of sort of prestigious cultural institutions and very, very nice person. And he came down and he looked, or he looked at my group, um, you know, shook the hands of every single person I was with and said, I thought there were five people that were gonna be here today. He said, I thought there were going to be five people here today. Um, and then our partner, who was very embarrassed, said, yes, yes, of course. Panthea's right here. Panthea's up there. And so throughout the next four hours, over the course of dinner, over the course of the tour, over the course of talking about projects, I 
just felt an incredible shame. Um, and it was difficult for me to sit there and to come up with creative ideas around cultural imagination about transforming cultural institutions. And I still feel I'm very lucky because being East Asian, I am often discriminated against, but not, but, but, I, am sp but I am spared the, de the dehumanization that a lot of my black peers face. Um, anyway, this is an image from the Brooklyn Museum uh, this past weekend. We had 15,000 people in Brooklyn turn up for Black Trans Lives Matter. Um, and it was a really beautiful, beautiful protest. And I think what we are seeing is now we are seeing, um, you know, I think Charles was pointing this out, culture 1.0, culture 2.0, culture 3.0. In 3.0, we are seeing people that have long been rejected, long been marginalized, long been dehumanized by the system, by the gatekeepers, taking things into their own hands. Um, the Brooklyn Museum is both amazing and has some problems um, in terms of um, how it approaches issues of uh, social and racial justice. And, and, I, and, I, and I think now about two peers and colleagues that are working in the space of cultural transformation. Uh, this is some incredible work from Monument Lab where they have been working in the city of Philadelphia to transform um, and to petition the city around um, how to shape conversations around public space, what, mon what, what uh, monuments are shown. And they've done some really incredible work with city residents to show that, um, as you can see here, one of their key themes is people in Philadelphia are craving representation and they are not seeing it in the statues that are around the city, the monuments that are around the city, and they want change. And many of us have been working through bureaucratic channels, working through city government and seeing some really great progress, but we're also seeing now, today, people are tired of working through um, institutions. And we're now seeing about how do we actually take down these monuments um, and how to have a more rapid, um, urgent, necessary conversation around, um, around uh, the cultural spaces that we are inhabiting. You're seeing a reckoning happening in many, many different industries. Uh, this is in publishing, where um, recently this hashtag, publishing paid me, um, are you know, showing us very clearly whose voices matter and whose voices um, society matters in the publishing industry is choosing to show. Um, to Jesper's uh, Nelson Goodman quote, a novel does exemplify a lot, but who gets to tell these stories? Who gets to tell these novels? And by the way, the writer on the bottom is a, is a, is a, is a, is a Hugo winner. Um, and you can see just the disparity here. New York Times um, bestselling list. I mean, I think this says a lot. And so we're seeing now people that have never been allowed in these spaces creating their own spaces. I really urge everyone to go to this link at the bottom of the page. Um, Aja Monet is one of my favorite poets um, and she's been hosting these really incredible series of black poets um, presenting and reading their works that don't usually get entry into, the, um, into many of the mainstream spaces. And um, please watch and please donate and contribute. Um, there are links here. Um, and so, and we're seeing, um, I'm not going to sort of get into this, but basically we're, we're, we are seeing a bypassing and a, and a rupture of the traditional structure, the, 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 the traditional gatekeepers. And a lot of my work now, and then I'll sort of um, stop and uh, pass the mic, but a lot of the work that I'm interested in now is actually how do we reconcile these? How do we reconcile these spaces with the mainstream spaces that have still the resources, the, the, the sort of gatekeeping potential, the power and the authority and the distribution? Um, and so uh, this is some of the work that my team is organizing around here in New York, how to imagine sort of um, futures that are equitable um, from the perspective of people that have been long oppressed. And, um, and so how do we sort of think about gathering inputs in spaces that are different and accessible to everyone? How do we sort of aggregate the, the, the variety of hopes and dreams that New Yorkers have? How do we um, put them out into public spaces because we often are, in, you know, do not have access to, um, to the curated um, and gated spaces? And, how do we you know, take over public spaces in a way that represents our aspirations and our hopes and our dreams? Um, and, um, and so this is some of the work that we are organizing. We are challenging notions of what art is, what artists do, um, and what spaces we can use and, um, and co-opt and take over to, um, to really um, share our visions. Um, and then we, we are working with the city to 
be able to aggregate these and use cultural forms of um, input gathering to be able to essentially design visions of the future that are um, that are more equitable and just. And so I don't want to dwell on this. I'm happy to dispose. Um, and so, yeah, sorry, that was a uh, guest for head said that this could be uh, a little bit messy. And so these are just thoughts in progress. Thank you. Thanks so much, um, Pantia, for, for sharing um, both the, the work as, as not least the, the personal experiences. Um, it's clear that, that it's hard to distangle uh, the two. And um, I think the question of uh, sort of reimagining cultural institutions, we, we will certainly come back to that. But, but I think you provided a lot of really good food for thought, also in terms of what it could look like. Um, whether it's about kind of um, ensuring representation uh, of the public, uh, or whether it's about the, the particular artifacts or narratives and how they how they get to design how, to, how they get to influence um, what what is considered mainstream and, and therefore legitimate and, and so on. So thank you so much. Um, I'm going to pass, uh, as you say, the mic, uh, the virtual mic, to Gabriella, um, sharing some of, of her experiences from from uh, Mexico City and, and beyond. So over to you, Gabriela. Thank you so much. And thank you so much, Panthea. That was lovely, inspiring. And also it leaves the, your last sentence is very well placed in where I wanted to start because um, in many ways, I also wanted to talk about spillover because I have the feeling that many times where we talk about discrete, unmovable, stable, um, objects of discussion, let's say, you know, government on one, then cultural institutions. But I'm actually incredibly interested in the spillovers, what happens in between. And another thing that I also want to broach, both uh, as, uh, from my work as a visual artist once upon a time, two lifetimes ago, as well as deep in the entrails of government, is what happens and how can we actually start democratizing imagination. So basically, where I will start the story, We just lose Gabriella. Yeah, I think her connection must have dropped off. She's left the. She's not on that. She's not on the distance. It's probably the worst timing I've ever experienced in a Zoom call. Uh, people dropping out. Let's just see if see if she can lock on again. Wait one second. It's a bit of reflection time given to us. write down initial reflections or questions. Um, if you can share them in the chat, that's even better. Um, and then we'll, we'll pick them up in the discussion um, and then just give a, Gabriella a chance to reconnect. Otherwise, we'll, we'll engage in a bit of discussion and hope she, she'll be able to rejoin. So one or two minutes of reflection.
we'll see if she's she's back on. Uh, but then for now, let, let's let's just try to pick up a few questions. There was certainly a lot of food for thought uh, in Charles and Panthers interventions. So let's start there. Uh, can I can I answer someone's question or not answer yes. it? <laughs> yes, please. Which question? Uh, there's a question there about other places, activist communities, uh, etc., sustaining themselves through time. Mm. Uh, bizarrely enough, I live in a strange place, but um, in the UK. But next to me, the, the, my main town is a place that for a hundred years has been based on alternatives in one way or another. It happens to be called Stroud, it's an old textile place and stuff like that. But many years ago, a hundred years ago, Tolstoyan self-help community developed, self-build as part of just around the corner of self-build community, again, a hundred years old. But anyway, a lot of things happened through time. But one of the things, the local cafe, my local cafe was where Extinction Rebellion was founded. So whenever I have a vi visitor, I take them to cafe Cafe Anise and make sure they have a photo in front of it. Now, there's a certain sort of stroppiness about the place, stroppiness in the good sense, and some people will say it's holier than thou because there are more, I don't know, there are more alternative doctors than any in, in the, the other place. But what's very interesting is that for a hundred years, there's been uh, the, the, this uh, something that's sort of, you could say it's in the DNA. And the other place, that again is of a similar size, I'm just talking about the UK just as an example, is a place called Totnes where the Transitions Town movement developed, which again is how do you actually live the transition to a different sort of world? Obviously one of the elements is uh, eco-based. But just seemed to me very interesting because for years I've been trying to ask, how do you, I'm trying to answer that question that, that, that was asked, how do things sustain through time and continue from one generation to the next. And what just strikes me here is both of those places are relatively small. It's a sort of 30,000 place rather than the 9 million place. And that's what's so difficult. And I can't answer that question. There's always great projects in places like New York, like Pantheas and so on. But it's how do you bring them all together, those fragments together? And I can't answer that question, but all I do know is I just gave you two examples, which is just for me very interesting. I also, um, I don't know, uh, sort of, fa I, I don't have any favorite examples, but something that comes to mind for me um, when I saw that question was, uh, so just the photo I showed this weekend at the Black Trans Lives Matter um, protest march, uh, one group announced that they have been trying to build, uh, uh, they have trying to been, been trying to buy property and build housing for black trans women. And they had raised a million dollars. Um, and the crowd cheered, it erupted. And I think, you know, um, both my, I was both so, uh, my heart soared and broke at the same time, I think when I heard that. Because if you think about a million dollars, um, for a nonprofit to buy and run a bunch of housing for many trans women. I mean, just think about that for a minute. Think about the sort of program that I just showed, uh, the number of top tier $1 million or more donors. And so that, that jogged my memory, um, that sort of, that's what that tr triggered for me because I, I think it's so hard um, for activist communities, for marginalized communities to keep sustaining themselves. Um, and I think I've seen some really great conversations lately also around whether um, and how funders should provide support for uh, mental health, for therapy, for self-care essentially um, of activists and uh, activists and marginalized communities. And I think that's a really important conversation. Um, I really appreciate you know everyone being supportive um, and Sorry, I cracked a little bit um, when I was talking, but I don't think my experience is particularly sort of difficult um, or new or novel. I think I'm actually, you know, very lucky. And, but it does take a lot of energy, I think, for, mar you know, communities that are really marginalized to compartmentalize, to hold back the grief and the anger. Um, it takes so much energy to show up in spaces and advocate 
and also tend to the hurt. And so I think we just need to have conversations around what types of resources and support beyond financial, beyond, you know, just they are surviving, um, you know, that we provide to communities to make sure that they can sustain themselves over time. Maybe a, a quick follow up, um, maybe just get you, getting your thoughts. It seems to me that, that, you know, I don't know if it's in a definition or not, but activism is off, often is a kind of a counterculture. So it, it needs something to be opposed to, or it's kind of a mainstream to, um, to challenge, if you will. Um, and then it's like, it seems to me that the part of that question in terms of sustaining it and when it's growing and beginning to mobilize uh, more, maybe also across cities and so on, um, the, the difficulty is to, to kind of go from a counterculture to, a, to a something else, to a kind of a, uh, and it's that sort of sort of emergence that seems to be really difficult to govern or to steward or whatever the word is. Um, I don't know if you have thoughts or experiences around that and, and whether, you know, in some case we activism always exists as a counterculture as opposed to a more mainstream thing. I can start. Mm. Just I have, I have some quick thoughts on that just based on the based on the current work that we're um, organizing because I think also someone I think Brioni asked about um, the people's task force work. I think that's actually been really fascinating because that to us is an exercise in radical co-creation between activists and governments and artists and researchers. Um, and it has been so fascinating to me to work with, um, as I think I mentioned in the chat, um, artists and culture funders um, because you know, I think so much of what we see as social justice art, um, as protest art, um, as the graffiti that then, um, you know, we sort of put in the museums as our sort of, you know, uh, check that we are, you know, being, being inclusive. Um, I think that, I think, you know, we have, I think activists um, and then artists that support activists, you know, often then end up putting ourselves into a box. Uh, we are always going to be in opposition. Um, and, and I think that's a really important role that we need, a very important voice that we need. But then once we're bringing everybody to the negotiation table, as it were, I think that it is often difficult uh, for those that define themselves in counterculture to then work in concert with government to be able to advance proposals to move things forward. Um, and so, you know, what I mean by that, um, some of the, the mock-ups and, and, and the prototypes are showing you know, in talking with artists and activists, um, and I think artists especially, they're saying, well, you know, we're, we're, we're basically asking them to take the visions and the aspirations and the hopes of New Yorkers that have been long oppressed and use them as the ingredients for their art. Um, and they are, and many are saying, that's, that's, that's not art. That's not art. Um, art, you know, we, we've sort of, I think we sort of have this social notion of artists as people that sort of, you know, cultivate this within themselves and are sort of the geniuses that then sort of, you know, sense and look backwards and reflect society back to itself. And when asking them to be involved in something that is forward looking and that yes, has to integrate with the bureaucracies and we have different data collection mechanisms, whatnot. It has been sort of really difficult, um, I think, to, you know, get them to get on board with um, defining a future vision, you know, with government together because we, we're, we're so entrenched in what our conception of self is. Um, and with the culture funders too, and you know, it's a uniform, but some of the conversations I've had have been like, well, but don't we know what the people want already? Don't we know what the issues are? You know, here are some of our grantees, here are some of the artists that we work with, why don't you just work with them? And that's been really infuriating. Um, but I think, anyway, so that's just some initial thoughts on that. Charles. Thank you. Uh, I don't know if I've got anything dramatic to say, but uh, yesterday I was saying that from the point of view, when, when we look at situations, there's often a project. When you take the helicopter view, I mean, you've probably got a helicopter view of New York. You can probably see these lovely elements here and there, and then the, obviously the opposite, horrible things. But if you just, but too often the thing is just the pilot project, the project we've just funded for three years or two years or one year. And so for me, the challenge is all that thing about scaling up critical mass and then embedding the change, the change that you were doing through your last picture that you were exemplifying there. 
And I think that for me, that's where I got a bit into the bureaucracy thing, because although I'm sort of the founder, if you can call it, of the creative bureaucracy movement, I don't even work in a bureaucracy, but I've worked with them and I feel they're misunderstood and could play a part. And there is a lot of creativity and imagination in public institutions that isn't uh, allowed to be come out in any way. And that's why I'm personally so interested in how we can talk across the fragments, across the sectors, across the borders, in order to make one plus one equal three. Because I, I grew up, I mean, my whole life I've been within the maverick movement. My parents were bohemians. I'm probably a bohemian. I don't know if I am or not. But do you see what I mean? And I don't mind being the outsider. But at some point, you want the bloody change to be actually happen and, and be part of daily life and daily common sense, which is why, and everyone will take a different view of what they need to do with their life. I've personally taken on this bizarre role to try to bring the best of bureaucracy with these other movements from the artistic to the civic to whoever together. So at least they're talking on the same page, perhaps. But again, I'm being incredibly personal there. I'm not, not, I'm not worried about it, but I'm just saying, you know, we each respond in terms of the capacity that we feel we might have. Let me, let me pick up that point, uh, Charles, about bureaucracy. Um, and again, I, I do encourage everyone to, to chip in and, and, and I'm, I'm happy to call on people as well if, if you kind of want to elaborate on, on your thoughts uh, with the group. Uh, so do, don't, hold, don't hold back, um, but, but maybe, while you while you think and, and, and gather your thoughts, um, one and this is actually a conversation I did have with Gabriella. So now that she's she's away for for whatever reason, hopefully she's okay. Um, we talked about uh, well, why my pitch was sort of if I were to make an organization from scratch, I would make a new Ministry of Culture. Uh, with with the reason uh, touching upon one of the things you brought up in in your presentation as well, Charles about um, what you call it, homesickness or belonging. Um, because my sense is certainly here in the Danish context where I live, is that the Ministry of Culture have no idea about what belonging means for citizens in Denmark. Or if they have, it's a, it's a, it's a minority that they know of. Um, and so they're not really playing, they're not really serving the public as well. And this goes to your point, Panthea, partly but also just in terms of understanding people's lives more generally, like what do they actually consist of? What makes them feel at home in, in this place? Um, so I would feel like the, the ministry would be doing very different things if that was the vantage point uh, of their work. Uh, so going back to the question I wanted to, to ask, um, uh, so it's good that the bureaucracies might, might be full of people with, with creativity and imagination, but do you have any thoughts, Charles, on, on kind of the institutional changes that you'd like to see? Uh, and here I'm, I'm, I'm also sort of trying to reimagine a little bit um, when we're talking about culture change in government, not just people, but ways of operating, et cetera, et cetera. Well, I mean, can I just link it into a question that Bryony, who seems to be incredibly active, hello, Bryony, <laughs> asking all these questions about the one, two, three culture. I mean, yeah. clearly, as we know, the 1.0 culture is very much that patronage, you know, we define from the top. This is, I'm allowing you into these hallowed halls and these temples of knowledge, all of that approach. Some of that stuff obviously is very good, etc. The 2.0 is very much, you know, partly focusing on things like the creative industries and all of that together. And all of these things, not everything needs to be eradicated. But the third element is really, obviously, has institutionally a different form. If you say we're creating the enabling conditions where you can think, plan and act with your own imagination and with the representation that you're talking about, Panthea, love that word craving representation craving is another one of my favorite words um uh if you think that through obviously that means the person the idea of the expert in that simple sense is then broken down and you're creating an enabling type of organization 
uh, that begins to have completely different conversations and you, you're not even sure who's the definer, who's not the definer. Now this is very difficult for your classic uh, structure because they want certainty, predictability, and often they're driven by hierarchies and all of these sort of things and status. I mean, those images you were showing, Panthea, of the, of the guys and girls, I don't know, from the fundraising thing. I mean, all of that is their version of capital. Now, clearly a lot of that would be completely challenged. I personally think these big ministries of culture would be smaller. There wouldn't be one big chunky ministry. I think, I think that it would be localized as well. Um, uh, so the organizational format it would be much flatter. It would be more about open source, all the things that, that we all know of uh, that, that are part of what we're calling, thinking of as society today. And those open calls for stuff to happen would be unpredictable. Perhaps that last picture, there'd be all these things that those folks would be suggesting that we've never predicted. And they would, in theory, have to be feel open about it and feel that it's okay to take a risk. But they would provide somehow, I don't know how you do this, by the way, easy to say these things, difficult to do. They would provide a sort of sheltered, sense of shelter for those who are doing these risky things and it's all about safe space i mean i was with those people what are they called the yes club or whatever from new york i've forgotten what they called panthea in sydney and they had an event and it was just very yesish it was probably some of the people from from that big event you were showing and so you need to create a yes environment sorry i'm speaking in metaphors rather than in technical jargon thanks thanks charles Bente, anything anything to add on that or no and i and i and 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 i want to be clear i i'm not picking on those people um in the photos at the event i'm just i'm trying to show the disparity hmm. between them and the people that they're commissioning works and writing about and it was kind of insane to me that no one had picked up on this very glaring um problem with uh, this piece that had commissioned and had put, been put tons of money into and gone through the lines and all the rehearsals and it's no point. So I was like, it's kind of weird that the only black guy is, you know, <laughs> like it just, um, and so, yeah, I am um, perfectly nice people, but we all sort of have our own biases and our limitations. And, you know, it's, we're all sort of products of the world that we, you know, the sort of I mean, beautiful, but also greedy and selfish and hyper-capitalist world that we live in. And um, I think, you know, to the question of 3.0 to 2.0 to 1.0, I guess you're seeing a lot of 3.0 creators uh, basically just unwilling to wait right now, I think, for those uh, 1.0 institutions to, sort of, I mean, I'm getting tired of it. I've spent a lot of time trying to sort of bridge the 3.0 to the 1.0, playing by the rules of the 1.0. Yeah, 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 yeah. No, I understand what you're saying. Let's, let's like that's, take down. Let's let's look, yeah. like here's here's how you tear down a monument. I mean, that's like a very literal um, way that we are seeing these dynamics play out. But can can I just add to what you're saying, Panthea? Because what I was trying, obviously, you know, we were both sort of racing through a little sort of trying to stimulate a few little thoughts along the way. But what what, what I, when, why why I was showing these different pictures of, let's say, those Berlin things where they had the brass plaques of people who'd been killed and stuff like that. I was really saying me walking down the street and seeing those which you can because there's several thousand in berlin was like being in a cultural institution the street at that point was the cultural institution or it was as meaningful to me as if i had been in a building which might have corinthian columns or something like that so what i was really trying to say um is if we look at culture in that slightly wider way um, and have as our ethos that thing that we need to come together. And I was talking personally, I want some sort of completeness. And completeness for me, by the way, means also in a city, and I'm obviously looking at it, uh, often look at things through the lens of the city, 
is in a sense that thing that's why I like city centres, where it, which in theory at its best is the neutral territory where difference comes together in some sort of way because then we dissipate into wherever we live. Um, but but for me, that's why I'm, that what if question is so interesting. I did a project called What If and got the cultural barons of Berlin to come together and say, look, just pretend you don't exist. Now, would we invent an opera house in the way it is? Would we invent a museum within the structure? Wouldn't it be more like an octopus, a museum spreading its tentacles throughout the city of New York, being defined and co-defined by people in those tentacles? That's a different conception. So there might be 50 little elements of the thing we call museum that at the moment is one big building. Sorry, I'm banging on, but you, you get the idea. No, I think, I, I, I think that's a really beautiful and wonderful analogy. And I also think that, you know, even in city centers, I don't, they're not, I don't think they're new, they are neutral spaces. I think that, um, you know, this, the street art that we are all sort of, you know, moved by and identify with, that's on the street. And that, you know, and so then what does that say about, you know, the galleries and the institutions that, you know, are, I mean, the people that are working on the street do not have the same access to resources and attention and whatnot. And so, you know, we can say this is really inspiring and wonderful, but then how do we actually change that, change those dynamics? And Charles, you have much more experience with this than I do, so that it's not on the street um, that we are finding the art and the messages that speak to us. Um, and because I think, um, you know, there's a lot of problematic dynamics about that as well. Look, look, I completely agree with you. I'm, I'm just sort of, yeah, yeah. all I know, this is just my little what if question, which doesn't mean I know the answer, of course, is I just know that if you and I, and this, this room here, our, our virtual room, had a brainstorming session and had relatively a lot of power, and we just sort of co-invented something, I think whatever we would invent would be quite interesting. It certainly would be different from what is today. And it would probably be different in, in, in um, I don't know where, in New York from, I don't know, Nice in France or something like that. Um, but within it, there would be some principles. And when I talk, I mean, you're completely right. The city is obviously, uh, I said, in an ideal world rather than the reality, because obviously we're excluded. In, if you do statistics, you find out that most people never actually get to this neutral city space where we're all together. But it's just me, again, back to my personal thing. I want to meet people who are different than me. Full stop. <laughs> Because if I'm in a place called the city, I want to feel the whole city. I'm incredibly nosy, yeah? I mean, I think I'm curious. <laughs> it's that curiosity that ideally gives me an idea <laughs> or something. Do you see what I'm saying? So I want the city to provide me with these opportunities. But I don't want it to be like, oh, it's about time. I don't know where you originally come from. You met someone from Thailand. I don't want it to be like that. I want to just be meeting someone from Thailand or Nigeria without even thinking about Nigeria or Thailand, but just focusing on the fact, sorry, this is where we all get vague and it's all a bit sentimental, but I'm just focusing on that other person as a human. Sorry, that's waffly. Get, get, get a bit more strict, Jasper. Uh, yeah, I'm, I'm going to go order. for a little bit. I, do, I want to see where, where it took you. Um, uh, actually, I think this, is, this might be a good time to kind of just pull in a few people from, from the, on the session here and, and um, see if that can, that can work. Um, even if Stephen is, is, um, is, is referring us to his book, uh, I'm a little bit curious of whether, Stephen, you, you, you're happy to share a little bit more about about your work, it seems like there's a lot to learn from you um, and your experiences uh, in working across England and Wales. Yep. Um, okay. Thanks very much. Um, uh, I, I'll, I'll post the the link to the book. Um, yeah. This is yeah, yeah. this is um, it's an international reader on community land trust. So this is um, North America, South America, Southeast Asia, um, Europe. Um, but the particular story in England and Wales is very much about how initially isolated rural communities were unable to retain um, their existing affordable housing stock, usually 
small numbers of council houses built in, in remote villages, which were lost under the government's right to buy program. Um, and in situations where um, uh, wealthy outsiders were able to buy up um, homes of kind of holiday homes, second homes. And so communities were unable to replenish their supply of affordable homes to keep local people um, in the village or to enable people to come and work and live in the village. Um, so they drew on the, on the US experience of uh, community land trusts as a way of particularly working with local landowners who were happy to put their land in for very low cost, provided they knew nobody else was going to make a kind of profit out of it. So the trust is the, the kind of custodian of um, the, the land value that has been foregone. But as a kind of phenomenon, it's really um, a response of citizens um, trying to operate where both the state and the, and the market are either unwilling or unable to do a job that benefits that particular community. So for you know, over 20 years now, we've been trying to create a kind of a set of nationally available resources that enable different things to happen locally. So you know, every local housing situation is very different from, from any other. Um, landowners are more or less willing in different places to um, be cooperators. Um, and eventually, I say, I know, a bit by accident, um, you know, a Chancellor of the Exchequer got up, you know, four years ago to make a budget speech with a directly kind of political bribe to um, constituencies in the southwest of England to keep on voting Conservative. But in the end, it kind of got um, broadened out to be a phenomenon where, as a national policy, the government has put resources into these kind of local enabling networks with kind of technical advisors who can support community organizations at a kind of local level, responding to the kind of the local politics, the local culture or whatever. Um, and um, so rather by accident, the government have created this kind of culture 3.0 approach to policy making, which is a kind of national policy that enables locally differentiated things to happen. I'm, I'm sure they wouldn't understand it if we describe that back to them as what they've done, but it is kind of what's happened. Um, you know, it, it's, not, it's not quite as simple and easy as all that, and whether they will continue supporting it in the future is, is another question. But I think what it has done is that it's enabled people all over the country to realise that they can be more instrumental in their local, in kind of fundamental decisions about how their place works. Um, so it has been a very, very exciting uh, time. And all the things that Charles was saying both today and yesterday about kind of imaginative, creative um, bureaucrats, some, some get it, um, others don't, but the ones who do get it suddenly think that there's something that they can work with together that will make good places, which they could never unlock on their own. Um, so it's a kind of really good example how the state and the citizen can find ways of collaborating to do things that neither could do on their own, but together they can produce something that they would never have dreamed of. Thank, thanks so much, Stephen, for sharing that. Um, a really, um, I guess, great example, uh, but also a, a tale of how, how long this takes, I guess, over the years and how you build. Um, I don't know if you had any like, reflections, Charles or, or Panthea, on, on that story. It's a, it's a long time. I've been at mm -hmm. it since the late 1980s. <laughs> <laughs> great. Well, my reflection on that is, and this is where impatience comes in, because I think a lot of us have been working for various, uh, for, for a while on, on, on various things, and that sometimes things explode. And that's why the recent events just show, just like Panthea said, I'm a bit sick and tired of going from, as a 3.0 person, going to a 1.0 person. I've had enough of that. Um, and I think perhaps this is, I mean, I, I don't want to get too COVID-ish and pandemic-ish, but is there a silver lining up for this moment where there'll be a shift? And that, that, that's for me quite an interesting point, whether the urgency, all of these things coming together, Black Lives Matter, the COVID and all of that, 
whether they in some sense coalesce and do something that might not have happened a few years ago, if you see what I'm saying. I mean, in other words, can you connect the pandemic to the Black Lives Matter to come couple some of these other things, which are variations of the empowerment agenda, the fact that the rich are getting richer. I didn't want to go through all that spiel. We all know that. But one of the issues about the networked world is, of course, those divisions are much faster than they were ever before. They're going much faster. I remember a friend of mine said already 20 years ago, the problem with the network society is those that are under networked only network with the under networked. So they're always under networked in a downward spiral of under networking, whereas the network, uh, a force uh, operated at a different speed. So you have these different networking speeds occurring. So that's one of the cycles one has to break. And whether one do, does that through polite chat, which Panthea is obviously sick and tired of, is one of the questions. Yeah. Let me, let me uh, pick that question up and maybe pass it to Ipsita, uh, if you want to weigh in uh, at this point, Ipsita, because um, you were talking about your experience coming from uh, academia and particularly um, the sort of social dynamics and the experiences of marginalized scholars. Um, uh, I, I wonder um, what your reflections are on, on this and, and, and whether you would sort of elaborate on, on some of the, the questions you, you had as well. So I didn't join the Zoom with the expectation of speaking, so please forgive the slight disjointedness. Can you hear me? I'm not sure if my mic is working. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, okay. good. So what struck me across both Panthea's talk and Charles's talk is that I ostensibly study American religion, I study Black religion, and I function or did function out of a one point, or I deal with a repertoire of American religion, which is predominantly a Christian, white, Protestant Christian thing in the United States. And I deal with um, institutions that similarly reflect that. And for the last 10 years, I've led a group of scholars who try to exist outside of that to enact a change. So we have people wielding critical theory, theology in terms of social justice, but the underlying capacity to see. Um, I, it was very striking, that visual from the opera of all white people representing a phenomenon that's you know, in the real world predominantly black. So I, I get the dynamics and it plays out on a small scale. The dark comedy of working with a bunch of marginalized scholars is that they still have to placate and talk through the repertoire while trying to change it. <clears throat> and they still have to placate for getting jobs, institutional promotions, that very white Protestant establishment which fancies itself social justice minded, et cetera. The other thing, and um, it's just funny that at a micro scale relative to the civic activism that, and the global civic activism that we both have noted, that insurgents are not the best bringers or they, they don't bring sustainable change very easily. They, they're used to insurgency mode and it's almost when you're trying to channel that energy, it's like persuading a hammer that not every problem's a nail. Um, and it can be frustrating as much joy and energy they bring, the sustaining thing you need. Finding a sustainable structure that's flexible enough to allow for the academic equivalent of artistic expression. This has been sort of the this has been the challenge. It's very rewarding when it happens. And I, I think part of my angle of questioning to you both is that I'm trying to find a sustainable model for a very disparate community of practice across. I have more methodologically in common with somebody who studies Chinese Buddhism um, and my own field is African-American religion because they're archivists who also do ethnographic work and they, they do that as opposed to theologians who, uh, American theologians who technically are material closer, more close to what I do. So I wanna thank you both for breaking it out like this because I feel less isolated 
as I go about my own kinds of problem solving. Um, so I, I misspoke when I said favorite example. Um, I think, and both of you spoke into it, so thank you for that. I'm trying to create a model of sustainable change. And it's extremely frustrating because you, to take the example of suddenly raising a million dollars for housing for black trans women, what the 3.0, the, the third group ends up doing is compensating for absences or voids in the institutions or repertoire that is methodically just deliberately misrecognized or un, left unseen. So I, I guess I want to affirm what Cynthia and Charles have been talking about <laughs> because I mean, I live or have lived the microcosm of the tension between the three realms. <laughs> and the intransigence of the problem. I don't know that I'm any further along in aiding and abetting an art, a group of marginalized scholars than I was 10 years ago when I started. So with that. Thanks so, so much for sharing that, Tita. And um, I'm mindful of time, so I will let Charles and Pente quickly reflect if they have thoughts. Um, but, but really, uh, thanks so much for, 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 uh, for sharing your, that experience and, and in a way confirming that there's probably a community of practice here that, that should be more engaged uh, with each other and, and, and maybe more defined in, in some respects. But Charles, Pantia, any last sort of reflections from you? And, and we Well, I'd just like to know it. who some of these people are, like Zeping, yeah. I like that name, Zeping Zhang, and who's Nasli <laughs> Valier. I just like to, these obscure names, they're not obscure, they're to themselves, they're not obscure, but to me they are. Anyway, no, that's a silly uh, thing from me. No, no, I think it's great that we're just talking in a very informal, relaxed way. And, you know, we don't, you know, we're not sure of answers, but we think we probably think certain things are more right than others. So, no, I, I, I've enjoyed the conversation. Sorry, that's not very revelatory, but there we are. Thanks, Charles. Okay. Just to the colleague that just spoke, sorry, I, I actually can't see your first name. Um, oh, sorry, Ipsida. I uh, let me type it out. No, 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 it's fine. Um, uh, that was the most um, thoughtful and eloquent, but I hadn't prepared anything comment that I'd ever heard. Um, so thank you for sharing that. Um, it, it sort of hit my heart in lots of different ways. Um, and I think sort of the the sort of trying to be the insurgents um, while playing within the boundaries and norms of traditional institutions without like that's something that I um, I feel very deeply. Um, and, you know, how to, you know, your questions on how to find and support a sustainable, flexible structure that sort of can bring about this change, I think is, I think is the question of our time. Um, and I think that, um, and and how to do it in a way to also um, not let traditional institutions be like, oh, well, good, like civil society and, and like community groups are doing great. They raised a million dollars, they're all good. Because I think I, 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 I worry that then we let that be a substitute um, for the work exactly. that we need to do. And it's an abdication of responsibility. Um, yes. And so that's what I think a lot about. So thank you. I, I'm glad you feel firm because I, definitely feel your struggle and you're on the yours makes a difference in whether people live or die mine is whether or not people get a voice and but it's different ends of those are, those are the same thing though i think those are the same thing yes um harvey milk silence is death visibility is life so. i think that's the quote we will end the end the session on i think it's very appropriate uh, I want to thank everyone for contributing, particularly Panthea, Charles, Ipsida, and Rioni, and, and all the others, Stephen, um, for chipping in along the way. Uh, this obviously is a work in progress as well as a conversation in, in progress, particularly I think this, this point about insurgency within the current system and what that looks like. It's been a common theme throughout the, the Learning Festival. Uh, so some more on that, certainly. Um, whether we reinvent the cultural institutions, I guess it's to be seen. Uh, there's certainly some people on this call that are more than capable of, of driving some of that work. So I'll be looking forward to following that. And, um, but for now, thank you all for, uh, for joining and uh, thanks for the conversation. Thank you so much.
Thank you very much. Bye. Bye. Bye.